Good morning. Good morning. Is my mic on? Try it again. Oh, yeah. Okay. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Bruce Hanneman. I serve congregations in Wyoming, Nebraska, and in Minnesota until retiring about a year ago. I am now serving quarter time in Princeton, and I am here to lead you in worship today. We'll be following the order of worship as is outlined for us in our service folder, following the order of worship on pages 172 and following in our Christian worship hymnal. On the secular calendar, we have reached the second Sunday after Pentecost, but on, or on the church calendar, we've reached the second Sunday after Pentecost, and the secular calendar today is Father's Day. And that's probably more well-known among the people in our community. So today we are going to focus on a gospel text that helps us to appreciate the role that Christian fathers play in seeing that their children are reared in the teaching and admonition of the Lord. But it really applies to every Christian in general. So we'll focus on fathers, but it applies to us all. We'll begin our service with a hymn. Our opening hymn is 871. <laughs>
Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Continue with the confession of sins. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trust in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious God in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a servant, a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you rule over all things in wisdom and kindness. Take away everything that may be harmful and give us whatever is good. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. First of our scripture lessons is taken from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. We read from chapter 43, beginning at verse 8. In this section of scripture, the Holy Spirit through the prophet Isaiah is challenging the nations and God's people to talk about a God who is more superior to himself. His assertion, there is none. And God's people are to be a testimony of that. We read, Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Which of their gods foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was sworn, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I am not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient times I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand when I act. Who can reverse it? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Continue now with the Psalm of the Day that is on the insert in your service folder, number 66C, Let All the Earth. <laughs>
dive into our scripture readings is recorded in Paul's second epistle to Timothy. We read from chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. We don't know much about Timothy's father. In fact, it was probably Paul who was a father figure to him. But Timothy's was greatly influenced by both his mother and grandfather. And so he became a very valuable asset to Paul in his ministry. And in these words, Paul is reminding him that the gospel is not always well received, but he should not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, even though at the time he was a prisoner. We read, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. Night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and, I am persuaded, now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. we see that sometimes the power that God exerts is so frightening that the people don't want him around. In this instance, he saw to it that the man who was healed would bear witness for the gospel. We read, They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. And when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town, for a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, 
They ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. And all the people of the region, the Gerasenes, asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We'll continue with next hymn, number 744, Rise, Shine, and your attention is taken from the Gospel of Luke, we read from chapter 9, beginning at verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, 
Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. This is the word of our God. Please be seated. Beginning of the service, I reminded you that the church calendar, it is the second Sunday of Pentecost. That's the season of the church here in which we focus on how we can show our appreciation for God's work of redemption. But on the secular calendar, it is Father's Day, and that is probably more well-known by the people, our contemporaries in this world. And so it is appropriate that in the church we would look at the role that a Christian father can play in establishing those Christian values in their children. Because we live in a world in which that is desperately needed. The values that we learn from the truths of Scripture are being challenged, rejected, contested, and so it is important that they are taught that Christian parents in general, but especially fathers, take the lead in teaching their children the training and instruction of the Lord. But the father figure in our society isn't always respected and admired. Now, a lot of you can probably appreciate the situation comedies that go back to my era. The rest of you can watch it on TV land. Shows like Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, where the children were bound to run into situations and circumstances in which they needed good counsel and advice and it was the father figure that would offer that advice. I think especially the show Leave it to Beaver, Wally and the Beave, they got into lots of mischief. And whenever Ward Cleaver would address them, you would often see a look in his eye that I understand how they got into this. And then would offer advice that what they needed to do to take responsibility for their actions. And that is the kind of role that the scripture lays out for the father in our society to take the lead and to be that kind of person. But what do we see in our modern situation comedies? If there is a father figure at all, he's portrayed as some kind of buffoon and instead of going to him for some advice, he's usually the source of the problem. And so it is good for us to go to the scriptures and learn what kind of approach a Christian father, a Christian in general, ought to have. And we learn that in the example we have before us, where Jesus is kind of a father figure for all the apostles. Maybe not the physical father, the natural father, but a spiritual father. So that we are encouraged as Christian fathers, that Christian fathers follow Jesus. They follow Jesus in the way they teach the truth about Jesus, and they follow Jesus in the way they live by that truth. In the section of scripture we have before us, Jesus is in a remote area with his disciples, and he is doing something that perhaps relates to the second point more than the first point, but he gives them the example of prayer. It's probably in a location like that, that his disciples who had often seen Jesus in prayer asked, teach us to pray. And he taught them the Lord's Prayer. But on this particular occasion, he's asking them about popular opinion. What are people saying about me? Who do the crowds say that I am? And by doing that, we learn about a wonderful approach. Instead of lecturing our children, why not first ask them what it is that they are hearing out there, 
what kind of issues they are struggling with. The apostles offered a variety of opinions. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. And notice that Jesus doesn't just dismiss that, say, well, that's a bunch of folly. He really doesn't seem to say anything at all, but instead asks another question. But what about you? Who do you say I am? And isn't that a wonderful approach? Our children are living in a world in which they are hearing all kinds of things, all kinds of philosophies and approaches to life, most of which not only dismiss the values and the truths that we learn from the scriptures, but more often than not undermine or outright reject them. We could just say to our children, don't listen to that stuff. But that's an impossible order for them to keep. They're going to hear it no matter what. Isn't it a little wiser for us to say, what are you here? And after they express what there is out there to hear, then ask, and what do you think about that? We have done our best to establish the truths of scriptures and the values of scripture in the hearts of our children. Don't cut them short. They may have better ways to approach those things than we have. And if not, it may not always be best to counter that at first. When Jesus asked his disciples, what are people saying, they offered the opinions. And when he asked, what do you say, what do you think, it was Peter who answered for the group, you are God's Messiah. But what did Jesus say to that? He strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Why was that? Because the truth about Jesus at this particular point in history would have been taken wrong by the people of the world. And so it was better not to make that point, at least at this point. There too is a lesson. The world isn't always ready to hear what we have to share. We can share the truth, and we are to share the truth, but we cannot force anyone to accept it. We must let people know where we stand, but sometimes just leave it at that. That may be one of the reasons that, as Christian parents, as Christians in general, and fathers particularly, we don't always know what to say. We don't always know how to react. So give it time. I can draw from my personal experience. My father had an eighth grade education, and he didn't ever pride himself as a teacher. I don't remember on any real occasion that I even had to sit through a lecture. I got scolded a few times. More often than not, I would go to my mother. She seemed more eager to listen. She was always less busy. And when I had an issue, she would say, if she didn't know how to figure it out, she would say, well, I'll talk to your father and get back to you. If I had a request, I would go to my mother. And if she wasn't sure, she would say, well, I'll talk to your father. Or sometimes, go ask your father, but perhaps you have the same kind of experience that I had. That then I would go ask my father, and my father would say, well, what did your mother say? And I would say, well, she said it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and 
But my father wasn't. He didn't pride himself as a teacher. But he did always see that we were in church on Sunday morning. In fact, my dad owned a grocery store and he had a little corner office. And in that office, there was a calendar. It was from some insurance company. It was outdated, but there was a saying on that calendar that said, don't send your children to church, take them. And that's what he did. He would see to it that we were in church on Sunday morning because that is where he knew we were going to learn the truth about Jesus. And when we got older, late high school years, early college years, he would say, I understand that you're prone to get into mischief, but you just know that if you crawl in early in the morning, you're still going to church. And we did. And so that's the way he taught us. He taught us the way Jesus taught his disciples. By taking them. They were followers of him. They learned from his examples. In my case, I learned that Jesus was important to my father. When I was asked, what are you going to be when you grow up? Before I could answer, my father would say, He's going to be a pastor. Here I am. <laughs> I wasn't always sure about that. But he had it in his heart that he would like to have done that, but his life went in a different direction. He never went beyond the eighth grade. But he encouraged me by example, and in that way his faith was shared. But that isn't all Jesus says, is that we should teach them the truth about him. He also says that on some cases, you've got to live by that truth. After warning them not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, he then shared with them what the Messiah would experience. He said, the Son of Man is going to be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law. He must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. A Messiah that would suffer for the people, that wasn't the image that any of the apostles had. It certainly wasn't the image that any of the people had. <coughs> but it was exactly what God intended. Jesus knew, knew that full well. And he was willing to endure all those things for the likes of us. And the apostles would witness that to their own heartbreak. And Jesus told them, And if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be my follower, you must deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. And so it is that we live in a world in which we can expect that those values that we treasure from the scriptures are going to be challenged. They're going to be undermined, and it's not always going to be easy to stand up for them. And that has been true throughout the generations. There has been Christian martyrdom since the time of Christ. And it comes in various forms. In our current contemporary times, it seems it comes in the form of ridicule more than anything else. But again, we can't force our beliefs on anyone, but we certainly can share them. And there is nothing more powerful than just offering a humble example. <coughs> that we share with others what we believe, the values that we hold, and then we leave it at that. People will know where we stand, and we may suffer some ridicule, some insults. But those philosophies of the world, even the current ones, they come and go. God's truth will stand the test of time. We can be certain of that. And so there is no better advice, whether you're a Christian father, whether you're a Christian in general, or a Christian parent, to follow Jesus, to share the truth about him, and to live 
by that truth. And we all have to admit that we have our moments, but we probably fail as often as we succeed. But that's the beauty of it all. That we aren't saved because we always get it right. We are saved because Jesus got it right. Jesus lived and died for us. And that's why we can be certain we stand forgiven. And because we are certain that we stand forgiven, we are to commit ourselves to be the kind of shining lights in this sin-darkened world and the salt of the earth that only, by God's grace, we can be. And we will be that if we follow Jesus. Follow him in the way we teach the truth about him and follow him in the way we live by that truth. So may God help us all to do that to the glory of his saving name. Amen. <coughs> Please rise. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join now in confessing our mutual Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. continue with the prayer of the church, the responsive prayer of the church. When we get to the intercessory prayers, there is a list of people to keep in your personal prayers. We're certainly not going to uh, read all the names, but think of them as we say a prayer in general for them. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Word for us so that we believe and live the word we have heard today. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Move us to love all ministers of the word. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. And grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Protect us from the temptations that surround us. Give us pure hearts and minds. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Bless our land with peace and prosperity so that the gospel may be proclaimed to all. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Fill us with joy over every sinner we met and comes to trust in you. Send your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. And hear us 
as we remember them in our personal prayers. And also, Holy Spirit, thank you for the message of unchanging truth as you tirelessly undermine, as people work to tirelessly undermine its authority. Work the attacks against your church and bless our synod and especially our district with men who are faithful to your message. Gracious Lord, also protect your children from temptations to which they are susceptible when facing sickness and trials. Keep them from challenging your goodness. Keep them from drowning in self-pity. Focus on them, your unconditional love for them, and your unchanging goodness in your dealings with them. And Heavenly Father, as you establish the unique role of Father within the structure of the family, cause all fathers, to take ownership of their God-given responsibilities, especially to bring up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Lift the eyes of the distressed to your love in Christ. And hear us now as we pray in silence. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time our offerings will be done. us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in praying together the Lord's Prayer. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I believe we're done. <laughs> I haven't been given any announcements to highlight. You have this announcement sheet. Therefore, you have been asked to remind you that there is fellowship, coffee, and sometimes kind of treats to go along with that. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, then I thank you for the opportunity to lead you in worship this morning. Uh, third time's the charm. This, if you're not familiar with this order of service in Princeton, we thought just follow a bulletin. So I'm, next time I'm going to get it right. I will, as I will usher you all. I'm not sure what your custom is, but that's my custom. <laughs>